Okay, thanks very much, Miles. Uh, thanks to the organizers for this invitation to talk about research, you know, outside my front door. It's, it's, uh, it's been a while. I'm pretty much stuck here since March. Uh, waiting for that vaccine, looking forward to it. Let's see, so I'm uh, happy to talk about uh, this wor our work, work with myself and collaborators on uh, the dynamics of models of coagulation and fragmentation. Let's see, so I will start with just setting the stage and uh, that goes back over a hundred years now uh, to work of Smoluszowski, the uh, famous Polish physicist who described actually a, a set of basically kinetic equations for chemical reactions, a simple kind of chemical reaction in which uh, the only statistic of interest is, this, is the size of aggregates. So uh, clusters of sizes J and K can merge in this reaction by producing a sus cluster of size J plus K uh, with rates that are determined by uh, mean field um, statistics, basically. So uh, fundamentally it's a stochastic uh, problem where no, no, no details of space or other physics is, is considered except this rate of uh, rates of aggregation of uh, clusters with number density CJ uh, multiplied by CK with co rate coefficients A, K, A, J, K. And the clusters of size J plus K can break up at a linear rate. Uh, so when you do the bookkeeping over all gain and loss terms for size J clusters, uh, you end up with a set of rate equations like this. And uh, Smoluchowski derived what the rate, rate, rate coefficients should be for uh, Brownian motion of clusters with, which, are, which are slowed down for larger sizes. It's kind of fairly complicated looking thing, homogeneous of degree zero. And he approximated that by saying, okay, let's assume it's constant and we can solve the equations. Um, something I, okay, so, so uh, these, these equations are pretty simple. They're really simple kind of kinetic equations. They appear in a great variety of scientific uh, applications. So things I'll talk about will be will have some role today. Will be the formation of um, you know things happening in a first order phase transition, like raindrops, raindrop formation in clouds. Uh, of course, astrophysics is another case where these equations have appeared. Matter clustering together uh, that can appear in material science on a nanoscale. Uh, recent work. These equations like that appear a lot in discussing um, random random graph growth, the erdos renyi model. But more recently, random shockwave clustering is a case where you have Brownian motion as initial data. Uh, the solution resolves into a family of uh, Levy process uh, uh, profiles whose jump size distribution actually obeys exactly the Smoluchowski equations. Uh, in biology, there's models of telomere maintenance and Alzheimer's disease. And actually, uh, something I'll be also talking about a bit is, is, is uh, in population biology and application to animal group size dynamics. Uh, so I've described them as ODEs, but you know, there's, there's infinitely many of them. So I uh, and so the, the ma mathematical phenomena become, you know, not like ODEs. There's, Navier-Stokes equations in a periodic box become ODEs. Uh, so we really have infinite dimensional phenomena here. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's in it. the issues become interesting. So uh, some of the coagulation rates that arise in applications are kind of indicated down here. A great variety appear in many different areas of, um, areas of physics and, and et cetera. So, uh, typically homogeneous like this, although not always. So there's one down here, it's not. Uh, I'm interested in dynamics. There's a lot of other mathematical issues to do with these kind of equations, but I'm focusing on dynamics. And this slide's a little complicated. I'm not gonna belabor, but to mention that a couple of phenomena here are gonna show up later in the talk. That's the transport of mass to infinite size happening uh, due to Becker-Doring dynamics originally uh, established by Balkar and Penrose in the 80s. 
uh, basically happens in infinite time, clusters grow in size indefinitely. Uh, McLeod, the late great McLeod just de derived almost 60 years ago now uh, that gelation can, can occur, breakdown of mass conservation can occur in finite time. Uh, and it also can occur, can occur instantaneously. On the other hand, if fragmentation is strong, uh, you can get this transport of mass to zero size in continuous size models. Uh, something I do mostly for these kinds of equations, coagulation, fragment coagulation equations in particular, is study solvable cases. And that's going to show up cases where you can analyze using Laplace transform type techniques and understand scaling dynamics in detail. I used to say that was the only case um, when you could understand convergence in self-similar form. But recently, there's some work of uh, Canitho and Sebastian Throm uh, in, in, a, in a perturbation away from a constant kernel case, where I think that's maybe the first case that can be understood a little bit that's not solvable. Um, equilibration, these are kinetic equations. They're, they're kind of poor man's version of the Boltzmann equations. And equilibration is studied quite a bit in the case where you have detailed balance. And the kind of dynamics I want to talk about today is without detailed balance. I mentioned this new book on the subject by Banasiak, Lam, and Lorenzo. Okay, so today's talk, uh, I'm, I hope it's not too overstuffed. It's, uh, it's got three halves. Uh, the first part, I'll just discuss what, what are solvable models and how do transform techniques uh, allow you to, look, to study them. And then I look to look at this, uh, especially a special case of um, animal group size dynamics, where equilibration happens without detailed balance and has uh, you know, some nice applications of uh, complex function theory to do with pick and Herglotz functions, and a connection actually to the famous Hausdorff moment problem. And then the second, third part, the third half of the talk, if you like, uh, we, we talk about oscillations. And uh, we have a couple of models of, of oscillations that we can understand in one case rigorously in a becker doring type model with atomization and ongoing work uh, with my collaborators in Bonn. Uh, we've got a formal study of a becker doring based model with input in fun walks. Uh, OK, so uh, yeah, so this animal group size study is with Zhang Guoliu and Pierre de, de Gaon. Uh, that's, I'll, I'll focus on that for quite a bit. In the first part of the talk, uh, just briefly kind of deal with, discuss the extension to uh, fat tailed uh, uh, self similar solutions. And then uh, move on to the second half to discuss the oscillations, the ongoing work with uh, Barbara, Andre Schlichting, and uh, Juan Velasquez. It's almost finished. It needs me, it needs that, that it needs for me to work to uh, do something besides teaching, <laughs> to finish the, finish the manuscript. OK, it's connected to these other works a little earlier uh, that, that I, I won't be talking much about. OK, so uh, the coagulation equations in weak form, uh, the weak form of the equations is, is essentially a kind of generalized moment identity. So that you have a, have a test sequence Fi, I use some Fi times Ci, so it's a generalized moment. And the time derivative of that moment is given by this, uh, by this thing. So here's the, the rate coefficients. Those were the RJKs, the rate of the, of the reaction that takes, that destroys clusters of size J and K and creates a clusters size J plus K. And so in weak form, you can kind of read off what the dynamics looks like. So now if we choose specially um, exponential type of test function, uh, this is really, this, this, uh, we, get, we get solvable, the solvable cases, which are down here, uh, you get PDEs. So the equation is closed with those special rate coefficients. And so in the first case, the constant case, you get just a nice, uh, okay, it's a PDE because there's Q as an independent variable. 
Yeah, other, otherwise there's a kind of damped uh, inverse of Burgers equation or, or just the Burgers equation itself in the case of the additive or multiplicative kernels. And so we can understand a, 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 that a lot. Uh, there were some known formulas for solutions going back to work in atmospheric physics in the Nevada Desert Research Center, I think, in the late 60s. What could they have been doing about atmospheric particle uh, coagulation? Hmm. Something to do with fallout, I guess. So uh, now it wasn't exactly a Laplace transform that I took there. Uh, and that's interesting. So uh, there's these things called Bernstein transforms. Uh, so there's this book that appeared about 10 years ago by Rene Schilling, Song, and Vondracek. What's a Bernstein function? A Bernstein function is a C infinity function. It's non-negative. And the derivatives after the first one, they alternate in sign. And so the representation there, first representation theorem says uh, such a function uh, has a representation that looks like this. So there's a non-negative coefficients a0 and a infinity, and a measure mu, which whose only condition is that this integral converges. Uh, and then it looks like that. So the derivative of such a function, phi prime, is a Laplace transform. Uh, basically, so these are primitives of Laplace transforms. Uh, but these functions have nice, a lot of nice special properties. Uh, so they're stable under pointwise convergence, and we'll look at that in a second more. The composition of two functions like that is again a function like that. The composition of two Bernstein functions is Bernstein. And another key, uh, uh, really useful property is the primitive of a non-trivial Bernstein function has an inverse that's Bernstein. OK, the inverse graph is Bernstein. So there's some special properties there. And it's you know, well worth uh, perusing that book. It's just beautiful. Uh, so something that's not in the book, actually, is a continuity theorem that characterizes the topology of pointwise convergence. Uh, so these functions, these Bernstein functions, they, the probabilists call them Lapl uh, Laplace exponents. And um, they've, I've seen this topology used in various places, but the characterization, uh, Golden Menon and I had, had, had found this, but in a different terminology a dozen years ago. Uh, there's a recent proof in, a, in, a, in, a, in the paper with uh, Iyer and Leger. Uh, so to one of those Levy triples, the tri A0 infinity in the measure mu, you associate a, a measure, I'll call a kappa measure, on the compactified positive half line. I like this. So you put, you take A0 and it, it's associated with a delta mass at zero. A infinity is a delta mass at infinity. And then there's this measure mu with the, the weight, a minimum of S and one. You have a sequence of triples associated with, okay, the Bernstein functions phi n and the kappa measures kappa n. Then pointwise convergence of the Bernstein functions uh, corresponds to weak star convergence of the, the kappa measures on the compactified half line. So there's convergence integrated against test functions continuous at infinity, right? So that's that's what I mean. And uh, if and the limit, okay, the limits that you get uh, from a sequence like that, they're associated with a unique Levy triple. Uh, and so there's a correspondence that you can you kind know, of uh, define a weak topology on the class of Levy triples that way through these, through these kappa measures. So that's a kind of fairly simple variant of the classical uh, Bernstein, the classical continuity theorem for Laplace transform. Well, so I move on then to the animal group size model and discuss uh, the dynamics in that, in that, in that problem. Uh, so we were motivated by uh, Pierre Pierre de Gaulle noticing that there's a very interesting paper of a Japanese fishery scientist named Hirosato Iniwa. And he was doing a lot of data analysis for uh, okay, coming from the fishing industry. I guess in Japan is very important. They have very smart people analyzing this. So Niwa is a fishery scientist, but he formulated uh, a stochastic differential equation model for uh, how 
for the statistics of group size in, 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 in fish in the mid, mid ocean, so pelagic fish or fish in the middle of the ocean. And this, this not, uh, proposed a uh, scaling law that uh, with respect to the average group size experienced by individuals, so S is the size of a, of a group, a school of fish, N is the number of schools of that size. So S, N of S is the number of individuals in, group, in schools of size S. And so the first moment of that size distribution is the, is the, is the scaling, is what you scale by. And there's a scaling profile phi, which he solved a Ito, this Ito differential equation correctly to find in this form down here, kind of involving a double exponential. So we'll see is actually this double exponential factor doesn't make much difference. But what's important is it's very non-Gaussian. Uh, so there's a pre-factor s to the minus one with an exponential tail in infinity. OK, and he has this amazing double exponential pre-factor. Oh, but now to, to, to estimate what the variance was in, in his model, he did coagulation fragmentation simulations. And he knew about coagulation fragmentation equations, but he didn't use them to do this. And uh, that's kind of wrong. So this, you know, the processes are not really continuous. They should involve jumps. Um, and he kind of implemented a wrong boundary condition. But okay, but he's he did a very impressive uh, work to do this. So here's this data. And you know, it's over sort of two decades in scaled size for fish schools. And uh, there's six different kinds of fish all, all here. And the, the scale size distribution on a log scale looks like this. You know, there's quite a bit of scattering, of course, bio, biological data. But still, his, his prediction is right there on the black line. And it you know, looks pretty good. Very impressive. Uh, as I say, he knew about, oh, now, so here's the his emerging splitting simulations that he did. You know, fish schools jump around the ocean randomly. And so he simulated this. Uh, the schools jump randomly to chosen sites. If they arrive at the same site, they merge. They can split in two with a small probability per time step, independent of school size, and uniform likelihood among the different splitting outcomes. And so that defines a pretty nicely defined emerging splitting process. It's a very compelling model. And it, it lends itself to coagulation fragmentation modeling, uh, which he didn't do himself, but uh, he knew about it. A uh, Swedish group, Ma Johansson and Sumter, uh, did the, they did it more in discrete time. But they set up the model, OK, the merging happens at a constant rate independent of size. And the splitting happens uniformly among uh, the different splitting outcomes. OK, and they, ver and they verified that um, numerical simulations of the, of the dynamics, mean field dynamics, agree with stochastic simulations pretty well. OK, so that's nice. Um, there's a model that lacks detailed balance, in fact. That's, so that, that was the thing that struck us. In fact, Niwa argued explicitly against detailed balance models in the population biological, biology literature developed by some in Levin in the 90s. Uh, of course, if you have detailed balance, that's when the individual reaction rates for the J and K uh, reactions vanish for each J and K. Then there's a there's an H there, and free energy dissipation, free energy dissipates. And uh, actually, so re rather recently in the Becker-Doring case, uh, Canito and collaborators verified a dissipation free energy inequality that allows them to prove uh, exponential convergence to equilibrium in a kind of special case with linearly growing rate coefficients. Okay, I won't say any more about that, but we, we don't have detailed balance in the animal growth model. Uh, so what we want to do, of course, is what I want to do is use this solvability. Use, use the, the, the Bernstein transform, and it didn't work at first. So uh, what was amazing is that it works with a slight change. So if we allow these trivial outcomes 
that a, a J plus one size cluster, a J, a J cluster uh, can split into <clears throat> J plus one outcomes instead of J minus one uh, with uniform likelihood, then it turns out that the Bernstein transform, which in the discrete case looks like this, uh, satisfies the closed equation. <clears throat> so it's nonlinear. We, I knew, we knew that the coagulation dynamics would be would be simple like that. Uh, but the fragmentation dynamics yield this closed equation where you have a kind of averaging term, uh, which, which looks like this. Uh, so if you scale for large population limits, that's what this H represents, uh, you get a continuum model, a continuous size model, uh, which this equation itself actually transforms exactly to. And so uh, we're going to, for simplicity, we're going to be looking at that continuous size model in a second and try to understand equilibrium and convergence to equilibrium. Uh, so here's the continuous size model. You go to the, the discrete size goes, goes over to something which, you know, it might have a density n, uh, but in general, it's, there's a size distribution measure, uh, nu. And in the moment identity is a weak form of the equation, time derivative, there's a nonlinear be behavior that involves, looks kind of like a convolution. <clears throat> S sizes of S and S hat are destroyed and produce the size of S plus S hat. And there's a, a loss term, a linear loss term uh, due to, to the fragmentation. So the Bernstein transform in this case uh, then the averaging term goes over to this. So it's a, just a very simple averaging over the uh, transform interval from zero to Q. Uh, so it's kind of a beautiful equation. And it turns out it has a comparison principle. That's what allows us to say a lot about it. And there's a scaling symmetry, which the scaling symmetry is the basic thing which explains uh, the data collapse that Niwad had in his, uh, his graphs and his analysis. Okay, I wanna, what do we wanna understand here is dynamics. So uh, we look at the equilibrium. The equilibrium, there's, okay, very simple actually, first order ODE, which you integrate up and you find a, a solution in implicit terms. Uh, phi is a function of Q, looks like, well, Q is a function of phi. Uh, looks like that, you have to invert the graph. If you do the series expansion, there's an interesting uh, relation here to, they look almost like Catalan numbers. Uh, these are a little generalization called Fuss Catalan numbers, whose theory in combinatorics goes back a couple hundred years. So the, if these things think, appear in this, appear in the, in the series expansion of this function. Uh, with a somewhat different treatment of power series and Lagrange inversion, you get a formula here, which, okay, you look at it, this alternating series in powers with a leading power s to the minus two thirds instead of s to the minus one. And it's a little hard to see what's going on there in that power series. So you can get this formula. At least one thing is good for you is computing. So we can sum this series numerically, compare it to uh, Niwa's prediction, the double exponential prediction. And you know, on the kind of double logs scale that looks awfully similar. You know, it's a, you, despite the s to the minus two thirds, which causes some deviance in the small size, in the shoulder region of the plot, uh, there's amazing agreement. So within 20% actually of the Niwa, uh, the log here is just without that double exponential factor, it's even, it's kind of a better approximation. Uh, so this is the model, this is the size distribution that's predicted by coagulation fragmentation dynamics, or at least at the equilibrium. So, but what can we say about it? Actually, it turns out we can say uh, quite a bit. There's some interesting things you can say about it. Uh, the equilibrium for each fixed finite total mass, the finite first moment, and I'll scale that to one for this, there's unique equilibrium. Uh, the density has an is an analytic. 
Uh, so there's some nice density, very nice density. It's got an exponential cutoff e to the minus 427s and a prefactor that has power law decay, power law behavior near size zero and size infinity, uh, which crosses over between two different power laws. So you can imagine that uh, you can analyze power law dependence using Tauberian theory. What's not so easy is, is to show that that's a completely monotone function. It's C infinity smooth. That's what a completely monotone function is with derivatives that alternate in sign. And the reason we can say this comes from this uh, remarkable theorem that's in the book, the book of Schilling and Song and Vondracek. Uh, that's related actually to uh, classical theory of, of pick functions, or uh, Herglas functions. So in the book, you find this complete, so-called complete Bernstein function representation theorem. Uh, it's an extension, if you like, of Bernstein's theorem that says a completely monotone function is exactly a Laplace transform of something. Uh, so in the book, a Bernstein function with, okay, so it's a primitive of a Laplace transform, uh, but if it, ha it has a, it's a characterization of when that density is extremely nice, right? When, the, when is the density itself a Laplace transform? When is the, dense, when is the Le Levy measure related to a completely monotone function? That's true if and only if uh, the Bernstein function here, which of course is analytic in the right half plane, uh, ex extends holomorphically to the entire plane cut along the negative real axis, and which leaves the upper half plane invariant. Okay, that's what a pick function is. And so a pick function analytic and non-negative on the positive half line is, uh, is what characterizes functions with, that have these not, that are, uh, whose, whose levy measures are themselves have completely monotone densities. So it's a kind of double transform theorem. And so there's just this global analyticity property of the function itself uh, you can infer this this uh, this really beautiful density property, and so going back to the equation, uh, the point is we can verify that uh, global analy analyticity uh, for this for this function here. Uh, so that's a nice use of of uh, complex function theory. So. We wanted to say something about the discrete model, and it won't have a, a, a nice smooth density. So, <clears throat> what we need is a kind of analog, and uh, we can actually get get the get the corresponding result from an analog. So we can show that the equilibrium distributions for discrete the discrete model um, have the form of a power law exponential decay z to the j z is in zero zero one. Uh, times a completely monotone sequence with j to the minus three has decay as j goes to infinity. And uh, we can we, we get that result out of an out of an analog of the uh, pick function representation theorem, which which relates then to actually the Hausdorff moment problem. Uh, so the Hausdorff moment problem here is Hausdorff noticed that uh, moments of a measure on zero one uh, produce com a completely monotone sequence. So the higher order differences of the sequence alternate in sign. And that's an if and only if. So for a finite measure on zero one, it's uh, a sequence is completely monotone if and only if it's a moment sequence. And what we noticed is that uh, we can characterize uh, completely monotone sequences through their generating functions, or the generating functions of uh, sort of upshifted generating functions, uh, and that has to do with the, pick, the, the global analy analyticity property of the generating function. So, Cn is completely monotone if and only if uh, the generating function is a pick function analytic and non-negative on the line below the, the line below the the point one, the half line below one, 
or f1 itself needs to be a pick function. Of course, that's going to vanish at zero and change sign. But a pick function will have to be monotone increasing to preserve the upper half plane. And that's a, that's the characterization we found. Uh, so that's the that's the result we apply to get to get this characterization of the uh, discrete model equilibria. And I won't say, but we can we can prove uh, global convergence for data with finite first moment. They approach equilibrium strongly, and every solution with an infinite first moment actually approaches zero weakly. Uh, so I, I think I'm running a little long. I'm going to skip the discussion of scaling limits with fat tails, uh, which we extended that result to in data with infinite, infinite first moments. Instead, I'll move on and just talk about oscillations. Uh, and the course question, main, main question here is, can temporal oscillations persist in coagulation fragmentation models without detailed balance? With detailed balance, you expect convergence to equilibrium. So if we see that in uh, in this new one model, no, there's convergence to equilibrium, but there's a ver variety of cases now that we we've it seemed to be the case that temporal oscillations can persist. And the first case I know in a closed coagulation fragmentation model, where this was noticed, was in uh, a physical review in the physical literature. Numerics of a group here of uh, involving Brilliantov in in the UK and Kropivsky, uh, who, who does a lot of work connected with the applied math community. Uh, in this case, where there's an added nonlinear atomization reaction, so that's the reaction that's here indicated here schematically. Uh, so I think I guess you imagine that an asteroids, two asteroids meet at high speed and they just atomize each other into monomers, right? So now the rate of that reaction is again a mean field kind of rate. It's uh, Ki, Kji times Cicj times a factor lambda he has here. So uh, it's just the same kind of rate that, that coagulation can occur, uh, but they allow it for this atomization reaction. And so for certain, certain values of the um, exponents in, in this kind of power law current, uh, reaction kernels, they found persistent oscillations could, uh, could, uh, could appear numerically in, in a situation like this. So this was reported just a couple of years ago. Our work involves uh, a kind of analog, physical analog to an analog to so-called bubbling oscillators. So in this, in the phys chemical physics literature, about a hundred years ago, this was discovered by Morgan. The idea is that you have a solution in which some kind of formic acid solution is, is producing a slow supply of carbon monoxide in, in solution. So uh, slowly this is being produced inside the solution. Bubbles of gas eventually nucleate. They start to grow and uh, they rise in the fluid and they escape the, and they escape. Uh, so as they grow, once, once they form, they start ex exploiting the supersaturation. They grow pretty fast. Eventually they escape and the supersaturation is eliminated and uh, the, the system oscillates in this way, producing oscillating bursts of escaping gas. Uh, actually, this, this phenomenon is actually what under, underlies the Lake Nyos disaster that occurred in 1986, as carbon dioxide built up slowly inside the lake, in the depths of the lake. And, uh, and in, in that disaster, it suddenly it, it, it burst out of solution in a huge uh, outgassing of carbon, monox carbon dioxide and 1,700 people and uh, a lot of animals were, were suffocated in that disaster. So since then, I understand they've uh, put in pipes that go down and try to eliminate the, the buildup of carbon, carbon dioxide. 
Uh, so in the chemical physics literature uh, in the 80s and 90s, groups in chemical physics work on chemical oscillators. And one of the groups uh, looked at this, these bubbling oscillators. And the, one of the key equations they had involving involved discretizing, discretizing size and writing down uh, evolution equations. They kind of resemble Be becker doring equations. Uh, as, as, as the bubble size grows and there's a loss of a loss of bubbles uh, and they get this equation and they could see numerically oscillations. A little bit later uh, they derived a more schematic kind of model as a differentially delay equation that involves excess concentration uh, delayed and uh, in such a, in a linearization of such a model you can kind of see how complex eigenvalues appear, you can get a Hopf bifurcation, and there's kind of relaxation oscillations that can occur due to a sensitive dependence on that, on that delayed concentration. So our, our models are kind of motivated by, by this work. So in the simplest one, uh, I'll mention here, which is a kind of becker doring type dynamics in which Let's see, in becker doring dynamics, the coefficients for coagulation here, okay, only monomers uh, co coalesce with clusters of, of different sizes. And the rate coefficient for that is one, just as simple as possible. And the rate for breakup is, is one. So a cluster size j plus one can lose a, a, a monomer and, and that produces a an addition term, an additive term to clusters of size j, uh, that loss destroys a cluster of size j. Uh, so this is what happens for clusters of sizes two through some finite size m minus one. And clusters of size m can atomize. So we, we add that into the model. And that atomization uh, provides a kind of escape mechanism, which, which kind of recycles large clusters into monomers in this system and makes it closed. Uh, so in this system, okay, the, the M, M size clusters can, uh, they can lose a cluster or, or they can atomize. And that's what's, what's happening here. And then uh, the C1 clusters, or, or the equation is, has constant, is, uh, conserves the total mass. Okay, so you write this down and you do numerical simulation. Sure enough, there's a parameter regime where you start finding uh, oscillations developing. Uh, so this is just a numerical one. But what's nice about this model is it has, it has constant density uh, equilibria, which are pretty easy to analyze but through linearization. Uh, so this is a model where we can get a proof that temporal oscillations persist. And so, okay, we linearize around these constant equilibria. We get a big matrix eigenvalue problem. Uh, looks like kind of a mess, uh, but for sort of rows two through M minus one in the matrix, there's this tridiagonal structure. And that, that allows us to solve this differential difference, this, this, solve this pure difference equation and reduce the equations to two equations involving V1 V and Vn. So when you put, put it on the computer and just compute the eigenvalues, you kind of get this interesting structure of eigenvalues on an ellipse, uh, but there's one that's, gee, it's just peeking over there into the right half plane with positive real part. So the constant equilibrium destabilizes. Uh, and we can, we can analyze that. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, the eigenvalues one through M, one and M, the equations one and M uh, give you the, equations you need to solve. I won't write them down explicitly, but they're in terms of the roots of the, the roots of the um, characteristic equation for the difference, difference equation. Uh, so, okay, you know, luckily my collaborator is Juan Velasquez who just, he can calculate like the wind and figure out what the exponential asymptotics are for these functions. And, and, and so we could figure out then, then if M is large enough, so there's enough equations 
it's essentially kind of if the delay is long enough, reaching from size one to size m, uh, the Hopf bifurcations occur as this parameter, rescaled parameter, uh, k square root of m, passes through a finite, a finite list of numbers. So, so you, fi you fix any j, and if m is large enough, you'll get Hopf bifurcation at these numbers, numbers that are determined by a limiting kind of dispersion relation that's transcendental. And, and it looks like this. So you can you can figure out exactly where the <clears throat> parameters are in terms of solutions of a transcendental uh, uh, e equation t, tj equals tan tangent of tj. <clears throat> okay, so I won't I won't give any details about that. You know, the asymptotics are a little too hairy for me to try to do in a finite in a finite presentation like this. Uh, so I think that's where I, where I stop at that. In our more recent work, we've tried to go beyond the kind of toy becker doring model <clears throat> and discuss kind of real becker doring models with uh, input and loss. Okay, so there's the becker doring uh, the main becker doring uh, rate dynamics, clusters of size K meet clusters of size one. Uh, they can coalesce or, or break up. And that's the, the, the rate of that reaction. Uh, so C, CK now, uh, okay, that's it gains clusters to coming from size K minus one. It loses clusters to size K plus one. And now we've put in this loss term, uh, which R is gonna be very small. Uh, but as, as size gets large, we suppose that, you know, the raindrops eventually fall out of the cloud. It just models that process. And then there's the source term. So there's some source of monomers, water vapor coming from somewhere. Uh, so we're following work of Oliver Penrose and Lebowitz and other collaborators who did a lot of work on models like this. Uh, based on statistical mechanic, mechanics theory and computation to uh, propose rate, rate, rate coefficients that look like this. So for three-dimensional raindrops, alpha is one-third, uh, k is like the volume. And then there's this, this funny corrections here, which have to do with uh, the existence of droplets of a critical size. If they're big enough, they start to grow. And so there's the kind of critical monomer de density called ZS. Uh, below, for, for monomer density below the critical, there's finite mass equilibria. And they have this kind of detailed balanced form. You know, we're in the equilibrium. Uh, the flux rate is zero. And you solve for K plus one in terms of K you get this kind of product form. Uh, but for C1 bigger than ZS, uh, there's no equilibria. This, this coefficients that are here, QK, C1 to the K, that's gonna go off to infinity as K goes to infinity. And what Penrose uh, proposed in the 90s was that metastable states should appear uh, with this kind of tail cutoff. So the metastable states have constant flux. And the constant flux is normalized by this relation here where I had a typo on the slide. And then there's this, this sort of tail cutoff. So you have to do a fairly annoying and detailed uh, analysis of, of exponential smallness of these, of these cutoffs. And I'm not, that, that I'm not gonna show. Uh, but what we do, so I, and I'm going to wind up pretty soon, we do an asymptotic analysis uh, that uses these metastable states to describe clusters smaller than critical, kind of smaller and roughly the same size as critical. <laughs> um, for supersaturations that are just you know small supersaturations, 
Uh, it turns out the, the variance of those supersaturations is at a scale epsilon to the one over gamma, which is smaller than epsilon. So to kind of leading order, the supersaturation is constant. But there's a var variance that's going to happen at a smaller scale. Um, the critical size then is, is, is roughly this, this constant that is large when epsilon is small. When cluster size is large compared to that, uh, there's a transport approximation you make. So that's associated with the uh, infinite size time dilation phenomenon. But now we're going to have this damping. So we're not going to get out to infinity. But what's important there is just this uh, leading order behavior here. Uh, AK is like K to the alpha. That's what we have. C1 minus 1 is this epsilon at leading order. And then CK is approximated by a continuous function, a smooth function. So you make this kind of continuum approximation, a very classical kind of thing to do. And so you have transport. Uh, and, and the damping term appears over here. So things, things that manage to get out past the critical size, they get transported to the right, transported to larger sizes by this transport, and then damped. Uh, so that's the second ingredient. And the third ingredient is this extreme sensitivity of, of the nucleation flux, which is this flux here at the critical size, which is extremely small for the metastable states. Uh, and the analysis we do here is related to an analysis of Yossi Farjun and John New, uh, who did it in the physical literature. Uh, but it's, you know, it's related to Penrose's asymptotics. So um, for that, we're saying, OK, near the critical size, the nucleation flux is approximately equal to this, to this, this metastable flux. And that's an exponentially small quantity, j infinity, uh, multiplied by e to the u. In the right scaling, it's e, like e to the u. So exponentially small, but like e to the u. So, so those are the ingredients. And it yields the following kind of continual model. And so this is the model we kind of do numerics and formal, formal eigenvalue calculations with. So it's for large clusters with small input and loss. Uh, you rescale size and time and the excess, um, it should really be the excess um, number density. OK, and it's scaled to balance nucleation rate. So here we go. Nucleation rate, which is exponentially small, and, and the condensation rate. So nucleation rate is the flux through the critical size. And the condensation rate is the interaction with the monomers, right? the interaction of supercritical clusters with monomers. And in this picture, there should also be uh, a loss, a loss that prevents these these supercritical clusters from getting out to infinity. And um, that loss is going to suppress the condensation uh, of monomers. And so then the source can produce a buildup of, of the excess, con excess monomers. And so once the uh, supercritical clusters are, are killed, uh, that, that condensation can build up. But as it goes, as it proceeds, it kind of gobbles up these these monomers and suppresses the nucleation. So there's a, a competition between these two fluxes, uh, which leads to them alternating in their dominance, and that's what's going to produce the oscillations. So that's a kind of physical explanation for what's going on. Uh, what mathematically one writes an equation for rescaled flux which looks like a simple transport equation. You do a nonlinear rescaling of size with a damping. And then that uh, boundary condition is this exponential sensitivity, which is coupled back through the monomer interaction uh, to, the, to the field that's here. So uh, I'm just about finished. I'm going to sh I've got some numerical simulations to show you, maybe one movie. We do a formal bifurcation analysis 
which yields a delay equation for that uh, excess monomer concentration with this exponential dependence, but an infinite delay. So there's an infinite delay. I don't didn't see any theorems about that in the delay equation literature, uh, but we kind of expect that we can we can analyze that. Now, when you linearize around constants, uh, we get a dispersion relation. We need eigenvalues to be pure imaginary in an equation like this. Uh, for this, it's going to be a Fourier transform of a exponential density like this. Um, we do a saddle. We can do a saddle point analysis. That's one of the more fun points of the analysis. Do this saddle point analysis and find out when beta is odd, an odd integer. Um, there's an, there appear to be an infinite number of zeros of the real part of this, of this numerator, uh, that's, which is what you need to satisfy. And uh, there appear to be an infinite number of bifurcations uh, and for odd values of beta when, when, when the parameter nu is zero. So uh, with that, I'm going to switch over to, just switch over to, hopefully a desktop where you can see Uh, this is the agreement of the of that saddle point approximation with the with the dispersion relation. You can see it's really good. Here's a a little movie of the dynamics of these super super saturated clusters. Okay, so the peak of the clusters it gets damped as as they get transported to the right, and on on the vertical axis here we've got the uh, monomer excess monomer density, the U, which is going up, coming down as the peak is developed and starts gobbling up those monomers, and when it when the peak disappears, it builds up again to the to the to the input. Uh, so you get this nice nice uh, nice dynamics. So there's clearly more to um, to do with this. Uh, to, to, with analysis here, uh, but I'll just finish up mentioning some of these outstanding issues. Uh, so you know, we, we, we don't know if there's a, a coagulation fragmentation model that was just purely binary fragmentation uh, that has oscillations. Uh, we believe there is, but well, we, uh, we, we don't know that yet. Uh, we, we haven't proved an infinite dimensional uh, coagulation fragmentation model has oscillations. And so that's re that remains, and you know it's it's with with these large number of bifurcations, it's plausible that more complicated dynamics can can occur, and we don't know that. Uh, but and there's you know some applications in which one may might expect um, that kind of re recurrent crashes in population bi biology or fragment or financial trading problems where where, where groups coalesce and fragment. Uh, you know, maybe these, these kinds of models can, can uh, be of some relevance there. Uh, so that's where I'm going to leave it. So thanks very much for your attention.